Welcome, I hope you're blessed in the Lord today. This video we're looking, continue to look at Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23. Now in the last video in this series, I went ahead and tried to give the perspective as much as I understood it uh, from a video put out by the Standing for Truth YouTube channel, Brother Donnie uh, put out a video recently on these passages. And so I tried to go through and explain at least as best as I understood the argument from a free grace perspective, his particular free grace perspective. Uh, there's, there's many different views on this passage. But we're using this passage as a way to look and say, wait a second, we need to do theology or we need to read the Bible for what it says, what it's trying to say. We can't be tempted by the fact that we have a, sem a system in place and we want everything to fit into that system. And so we try to work passages that are outside that system into that system. But instead we need to come to the passage itself and figure out what is being said. What is God trying to communicate to us in this passage and then submit our system to that. Uh, the danger of theological systems when we get a, a nice package, something like Calvinism or uh, free grace theology or Hebraic roots or uh, dispensationalism, when we get these packages, it's very hard to let them go. And they can become a stronghold, something that, 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 uh, that oppresses or that suppresses the word of God. Because if it doesn't line up with the system, we, we don't want to go back through and work out our whole system again. And so what we'll do is we'll often be tempted to fit it into the mold of our system. And by doing that, we're removing part of the scripture and we're not listening to the whole counsel of God. So we're using this as an example. I don't mean to uh, pick on Brother Donnie over there at the uh, Standing for Truth YouTube channel, but uh, he puts out content that is, is kind of easy to uh, respond with because his attitude is he seems to have a good attitude so it's it's easy to kind of speak with hopefully he understands my heart is not to uh, attack him in this and I count him as brother and uh, yeah so it's not it's not intended that way but it's he he puts on many debates on his channel so I, I know he understands the concept of just sharing these ideas and dealing when wrestling with these issues so let's go ahead and look at the first way that it was interpreted in the last video I went through kind of their interpretation as best as I understood it verse 21 not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So this would, you know, on first sight would seem to be saying, just because you confess Jesus Christ as Lord, if you don't live according to the will of God, then you are going to be uh, cast out. That that doesn't mean you're going to enter the kingdom of heaven, it, it, inherit eternal life. But of course, in a free grace position, that's not something that wants to be easily accepted. So they will often jump to, or some will jump to, John chapter 6, verse 40. And because there's similar wordage here, this is the will of him who sent me. In other words, this is the will of the Father in heaven, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So what is the will of the Father in heaven here in Matthew chapter 7 verse 21, the will of the Father in heaven is that you believe in Jesus Christ. So it's faith alone, okay? The problem is, is that John chapter 6 is a totally different context, completely unrelated with the end of the Sermon on the Mount, which Jesus has just given his law, sitting up on the, the mountain and given his law. It's a completely different context than what we find here in Matthew chapter 7. So let's try to stick to the context of this passage and see what Jesus is communicating here. In the Sermon on the Mount, starting in chapter 5, Jesus goes up, we can see it there, John chapter 5, verse 1. Now seeing the crowds, he went up on a mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he began speaking and taught them, saying. And then he goes on, and he preaches the Sermon on the Mount, which the conclusion is what we're reading there in Matthew chapter 7. So in this Sermon on the Mount is Jesus, the Lord of heaven and earth, going on the mountain, sitting down, and giving his law. It's called the law of Christ in the Bible in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 21. Also, I believe it's in uh, Galatians chapter 6, maybe verse 2, maybe verse 4. So this is the law of Jesus Christ, also known as the royal law of Scripture. Uh, you know, love your neighbor as yourself, he says in, in, in the book of James. Uh, Paul calls it the fulfillment of the law or the righteous requirements of the law summed up in love God and love your neighbor. So in many ways, we find the law of Jesus Christ and we see it written out here in Matthew. He tells us, uh, he explains to us, you've heard it said in the Old Testament law, but I say to you, and he gives us his commands. Now, 
he nowhere implies in this sermon that he's talking about the context of justification by faith alone. He's arguing with Judaizers like Paul does in Romans or in Galatians or in Philippians. What we see is Jesus sitting on the mount, just like Moses went up on the mount and received the law, Jesus is now coming and sitting there as the king, as the master, and he is giving us his law. And at the end, we will see that it's the law that we are supposed to obey. So nowhere does he imply that this is hypothetical. Nowhere does he imply that, oh, I'm just giving you this law to show you that you can't do it. That's not what the sermon uh, presents. And so if we come to it like that, we're, come to, we're coming to it with something uh, outside of the scripture. But let's jump over after giving these different commands about versions of hypocrisy and uh, you know about uh, morality and the different things that he talks about divorce, uh, swearing oaths. In verse 12 of chapter 7, he begins to summarize what he's just said because he said he was going to fulfill the law. And then in verse 12 of chapter 7, therefore everything you would like men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Okay, so he just fulfilled the law and the prophets with his teaching. He showed us the righteous requirements of the law, to love God and love your neighbor. And here he uses uh, love your neighbor. In other words, therefore, everything you would like men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. This fulfills, this sums up the law and the prophet. And then he goes on, enter the narrow gate, wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. There are many who go in through it, because small is the gate and narrow is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. So he begins to speak about a narrow gate and a wide gate. What would this be in the context of his passage? Living in obedience to what he just said or outside of obedience to what he just said? That is the context of this passage. So a wide, wide road would say you don't have to obey what Jesus Christ just taught. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruit. Do men gather grapes from thorns or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a, bad, but a corrupt tree bears evil fruit. A good tree cannot bear evil fruit, nor can a corrupt tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruit, you will know them. Okay, what kind of fruit would we expect from the context of what we've just been speaking about? Well, those that live in lust, those that live in anger, those that live in unforgiveness, those that live in hypocrisy, uh, <clears throat> those that live uh, lacking mercy towards their enemies, all those would be those that are bearing bad fruit. Okay, so that would be what we would expect from the context that we've been reading up thus far. And then he goes on and says, Now, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So we would expect that this will of the Father would be the commands and the teaching that he was just giving us in the sermon that he is now concluding. For us to jump over to John chapter 6 and say it's talking only about believing is to completely go out of the context and find some words that sound similar and then try to import them back into this passage. Instead of going by the, the sermon itself and figuring out what is he saying in this sermon and in the conclusion of the sermon. So, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. So, just because somebody says that they are a follower of Jesus, they shall not enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father is in heaven. What is the will of the Father? To obey the Son, to listen to what the Son has just been teaching us, seated on the mount when his disciples came to him, and he said, you've heard it said, but I say to you, do this. And so, we're supposed to obey that. We're supposed to obey what he has been teaching. Now, let's jump over to Luke chapter six and you say but you just said we can't go out of the out of that uh context well we can't jump to a completely different context but we can go to a different passage that has a similar context and as we'll see here in luke chapter six this is the exact same context because this is going to be a parallel verse Okay, in order to see this, let's start in verse 43. A good tree does not bear corrupt fruit, nor does a corrupt tree bear good fruit. Every tree is known by its own fruit. Men do not gather figs from thorns or get So we see that that's the same illustration that he was just using. Okay, and then we jump down to verse 47. Whoever comes to me and hears my word and does them, I will, I will show he, whom he is like. He is like a man who built his house and dug deep and laid a foundation on the rock when the floods arose and the stream beat vehemently against that house but could not sh shake it 
for it was founded on the rock. So, okay, was this in the passage that we just read? Yeah, if we jump back to Matthew chapter 7, after verse 23, it says, whoever hears, the, verse 24, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house and it did not fall for it was founded on a rock. So we see that what comes before, what comes after is the same. We see that generally speaking, this is the same context as Matthew. This is a, a parallel passage. But what I want us to note is verse 46. Okay, verse 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Okay, now I just said back here in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And I said from the context, we would expect that everything that Jesus had just been teaching was the will of the Father in heaven, that his law and his commands were the will of God. And not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those that do what Jesus has been teaching. And then we jump over here to this parallel passage, this parallel verse in verse 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? Okay, so what is Jesus talking about when he's talking about the will of the Father according to this parallel passage in Luke? It's the same thing that the context would tell us in Matthew chapter 7, that Jesus is speaking about the commands that he just gave on the Sermon on the Mount, that just saying, calling him Lord, but not doing what he said will not cause us to enter the kingdom of heaven. So the video is getting a bit long, so we'll go ahead and stop here. But what we want to note is that this first argument, the verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. If we say that the will of the Father is only to believe, we are importing a different context into this passage. Because when we look at the context of the passage, it's from the Sermon on the Mount, his law, what his commands he's been giving, giving, giving us, and that would be the will of the Father to obey the Son. We see that confirmed when we go to a parallel passage in Luke chapter 6, verse 46, that says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things that I say? So I hope this has been helpful to you. God bless.